The Shirangama Sutra, Fascicle 8 of 10. Chapter 6, Bodhisattva Development into Buddhahood. Transmutation of Sansara into Nirvana. Thus, Ananda, each of these species has its twelve kinds of inversion, which, like dancing flowers seen when one rubs one's eyes, overturn the perfect and pure enlightened mind and cause wrong thinking. As you now practice the Buddha Samadhi, you should take three gradual steps to deal with the basic causes of stirring thoughts in order to wipe them out. This is like removing poisonous honey from a pot by using hot water mixed with ashes to cleanse the container. Only when the latter is completely clean can it be used to hold ambrosia. The Three Gradual Steps to Wipe Out Sansara What are these three gradual steps? They are the contributory practice to remove all accessory causes, the main practice to obliterate the basic causes, and the progressive practice to stop the growth of karma. What are the accessory causes? Ananda, these twelve species in the world owe their existence to four ways of feeding. By eating, touching, thinking about, and being conscious of food. Therefore, the Buddha says that all living beings depend on feeding for their stay in sansara. Ananda, all beings live if they eat wholesome food, and die if they take poison. In their search for samadhi, they should abstain from eating five kinds of pungent roots, that is, garlic, the three kinds of onions, and leeks. If eaten cooked, they are aphrodisiac, and if raw, they cause irritability. Although those who eat them may read the twelve divisions of the Mahayana canon, they drive away seers, or rishi, in the ten directions, who abhor the bad odor, and attract hungry ghosts who lick their lips. They are always surrounded by ghosts, and their good fortune will fade away day by day to their own detriment. When these eaters of pungent roots practice samadhi, none of the bodhisattvas, seers, and good spirits come to protect them, while the mighty king of demons takes advantage of the occasion to appear as a Buddha as if to teach them the Dharma, defaming and breaking the precepts and praising carnality, anger, and stupidity. At their death, they will join his retinue, and at the end of their time in his realm, they will fall into the unintermittent hell. Ananda, practicers of samadhi should never eat these five pungent roots. This is the first step of gradual practice. What are the basic causes? Ananda, those practicers who wish to enter the state of samadhi should first observe strictly the rules of pure living to cut lust from the mind by abstaining from meat and wine and by taking cooked instead of raw food. Ananda, if they do not abstain from carnality and killing, they will never escape from the three worlds of existence. They should consider lust as dangerous as a poisonous snake and a deadly foe. They should begin by strictly observing the Hinayana's four prohibitions for monks and eight for nuns to regulate the body, and then adhere to the Bodhisattva discipline to ensure the non-stirring of mind. If they observe these precepts, they will wipe out forever the karma that leads to birth and killing. If in addition they cease to steal, they will owe nothing to others and will not have debts to repay. Those who keep the rules of pure living in their practice of samadhi will be able to see with their own eyes, without the aid of Devasite, all the worlds in the ten directions. They will behold the Buddha preaching the Dharma, will personally receive the holy teaching, will win the transcendental power which enables them to roam freely in all worlds, and will acquire the Buddha knowledge of all forms of their own and others' previous existences, and so will be immune from all calamities. This is the second step of gradual practice. What happens when karma no longer grows? The minds of these practicers who observe the prohibitions now free from sensual desire, will not wander outside in search of sense data, 
but return to the inner mind. For lack of causal sense data, their organs, thus disengaged from externals, turn back to the undivided one, to which, since the six functions have ceased to discriminate, all countries will appear pure and clean. This is like a crystal ball with a bright moon inside it. Their bodies and minds will experience joy and great comfort in the state of absolute and perfect impartiality, in which the esoteric perfection and pure absoluteness of all Tathagatas appear. They will then achieve the great patience of the uncreate and will continue their progress toward sainthood. This is the third step of gradual practice. Progressive Advance in Bodhisattva Development The Stage of Dry Wisdom Ananda, these virtuous men will dry up their sensual desire and disengage their organs from sense data. This withering of causes stops the growth of karma. The clinging mind is now empty and clear, being but unmixed wisdom which is perfect and bright by nature, illumining all worlds in the ten directions. This realization of wisdom is called the stage of dry wisdom because they have cut off their sensual habits, but have not yet entered the Tathagata's Dharma stream. The Ten Stages of Bodhisattva Faith 1. After realizing the dry wisdom, if they use their progressive mind to look into the innermost depth, the perfect and profound essence of mind will manifest. This state of absolute perfection leads to that of true absoluteness, resulting in the permanence of absolute faith and the total eradication of all false thinking. This is the mean in its true purity and is called the stage of Bodhisattva faith. 2. Their faith, thus genuinely achieved, ensures their complete understanding, which is no more hindered by the five aggregates. 12 entrances, or Ayatana and eighteen fields of senses, or Datu, and thereby embraces the past, present, and future. Thus are exposed the vicious habits, which led to their countless incarnations in the past, the smallest details of which they can now remember. This is called the stage of remembrance, or unforgetfulness. 3. This absolute perfection in its purity causes the essential wisdom to turn all vicious habits contracted since the time without beginning into one bright essence which continues to advance towards the real and the pure. This is called the stage of zealous progress. 4. The essence of mind which now manifests is the wisdom that destroys the darkness of ignorance. This is called the stage of wisdom. 5. This bright wisdom now shines upon its own substance in stillness and profundity, thus ensuring the permanent union of function and substance. This is called the stage of dhyana. 6. The light of dhyana becomes brighter. It is now more penetrating and prevents all backsliding. This is called the stage of non-retrogression. 7. The mind, now advancing smoothly, preserves all previous achievements, and is aware of all Tathagatas in the Ten Directions. This is the stage of protection of the Dharma. 8. The brightness of wisdom, thus preserved and strengthened, can now, by means of its transcendental power, reflect the light of the Buddha's compassion, and thereby abide within his body, like two bright mirrors facing and reflecting each other to infinity. This is the stage of reflective powers. 9. The light of the mind then turns inwards and unites forever with the unsurpassed, absolute purity of the inner Buddha, thereby resting in the non-retrogressive state of transcendental non-activity, or Wu Wei. This is called the stage of unshaken discipline, or Shila. And 10. A great comfort derives from this rest in discipline, which enables the mind to roam at will anywhere in the ten directions. This is called the stage of the mind of high resolve. The ten practical stages of bodhisattva wisdom. 1. Ananda, 
After achieving these ten stages of bodhisattva faith by practical expedience, the essence of mind manifests and radiates. The intermingling of these ten functions of mind perfects the one mind. This is called the purposive stage. 2. The inner mind now radiates like brilliant pure gold in a globe of clear crystal. As the previous contemplative wisdom now reaches this mind ground, this is called the stage of the control of the mind ground. 3. The cognizance of the mind ground fully reveals both wisdom and its object as one reality in the ten directions, free from all hindrance. This is called the stage of bodhisattva practice. 4. This bodhisattva conduct is now similar to that of the Buddha which influences it. Like a dead man in the intermediate state, seeking parents as a channel for his rebirth in the world, the advancing mind enters the Tathagata seed. This is called the stage of noble birth. 5. The mind, gestating in the holy womb, inherits the basic Bodhi, and the fetus is formed with all its characteristics. This is called the stage of all in readiness for enlightenment. 6. Both form and mind are identical with those of the Buddha. This is called the stage of true mind. 7. The integration of body and mind becomes firmer with the passing of time. This is called the stage of non-retrogression. 8. The fetus is now complete with the ten aspects of the Buddha body. This is called the stage of Bodhi in its infancy or immaturity. 9. The fetus, now completely formed, is born and becomes a son of Buddha. This is called the stage of the heir to the king of the law. And 10. The celebration of his coming of age is like the consecration ceremony held when a crown prince assumes the reins of government. This is called the stage of investiture. The Ten Lines of Bodhisattva Action 1. Ananda, although these virtuous men after attaining the rank of a son of Buddha, have acquired the Tathagata's countless merits, they remain in harmony with all beings in the ten directions. This is called joyful service. 2. They are able to work for the welfare of all living beings. This is called beneficial activity. 3. Their self-enlightenment and the enlightenment of others are free from all contradiction. This activity is called non-resentful. 4. Their continuous appearance in countless forms in the unending future for the welfare of others free from the conception of time and space is called inexhaustible activity. 5. Their preaching, free from all clinging, conforms to the teaching of non-duality of all dharma doors and is called an activity never out of order. 6. The noumenal unity reveals a vast variety of undifferentiated phenomena. This is called skillful activity to appear at will. 7. In this state, all the worlds in the ten directions appear in every speck of dust, with neither dust nor worlds hindering each other. This is called the non-clinging activity. 8. All manifestations are but the highest perfection, or parmita leading to the other shore of Bodhi. This is exalting activity. 9. This perfect intermingling of noumenon and phenomenon achieves the Buddha pattern in the ten directions and is called the skillful performance of the law. And 10. Each line of action is but pure and transcendental non-activity or Wu Wei derived from the one reality of thatness. This is called activity in harmony with the truth. The Ten Acts of Dedication, or Parinamna. 1. Ananda. After these virtuous men have won transcendental powers in their performance of the Buddha work, they attain the state of pure reality, which frees them from all hindrances. They should deliver living beings without clinging to the notion of salvation, in order to turn the non-active or wu-wei mind towards the path to nirvana. This is dedication to the salvation of all living beings while avoiding the conception of saving them. 2. The wiping out of all that is destructible 
while avoiding the very idea of so doing is called dedication to the indestructible. 3. The realization that basic bodhi is profound and equal to the Buddha's enlightenment is called dedication to equality with all Buddhas. 4. Manifestation of the pure mind ground, which is identical to the state of a Buddha, is called dedication to omnipresence. 5. The free intermingling of the worldly and the absolute state of the Tathagata is called dedication to the inexhaustible store of merits. 6. The rising of only pure causes from the same state of Buddhahood in search of Nirvana is called dedication to the excellent roots of impartiality. 7. The realization of impartiality in this way, which reveals the identity of all living beings in the ten directions with one's fundamental nature, the perfecting of which does not exclude any one of them, is called dedication to the sameness of all beings. 8. The realization of the identity of all phenomena, free from all differentiation, with no clinging to either sameness or difference, is called dedication to the Absolute. 9. The achievement of this absolute state, free from all hindrance in the ten directions, is called dedication to unimpeded liberation. And 10. Perfect realization of self-nature, which wipes out all consideration about the realm of Dharma, is called dedication to the boundless Dharma Datu. The four additional harnessing stages, or Prayoga. Ananda, these virtuous men, after achieving these 41 stages of Bodhisattva development, should train in four additional harnessing stages. 1. The Buddha Bodhi, employed as self-mind, now seems to manifest, but actually does not yet do so. This is like kindling a fire by rubbing two sticks together in order to burn them. It is called the warming stage. 2. Further, the self-mind, now used as the ground for Buddha enlightenment, seems to rely on wisdom, but actually does not. Like a climber reaching the top of a mountain, with his body in the air, while his feet still touch the ground. This is called the summit stage. 3. The realization of the sameness of mind and Buddha, leading to the perfecting of the mean, is like forbearing from something which can be neither retained nor rejected. This is called the forbearing stage. And for being above all estimate and measure, the mean which is between delusion and enlightenment is neither the one nor the other. This is called the highest stage on the worldly plane. The ten highest stages of Bodhisattva attainment, or Dashabhumi. 1. Ananda. After these virtuous men's skillful understanding of the great Bodhi, they become aware of the Tathagata's full state of Buddhahood. This is called the stage of joy, or Pramudita, at having overcome all hindrances and so entering upon the path to Buddhahood. 2. They now realize that all differentiation merges into a single unity, which also vanishes. This is called the stage of freedom from all defilements, or Vimla. 3. Utter purity now begets further enlightenment. This is called the stage of illumination, or Prabhakari. 4. Perfect understanding leads to Bodhi in its fullness. This is called the stage of mastery of glowing wisdom, or Archishmati. 5. Realization of the condition beyond unity and differentiation is called the stage of mastery of utmost difficulties, or Sadurjaya. 6. The manifestation of non-active Buddha Tathata is called the stage of the appearance of the Absolute, or Abhimukhi. 7. Thorough penetration of the whole region of the Absolute is called the all-embracing stage, or Durangama. 8. Full manifestation of the Absolute One Mind is called the stage of imperturbability, or Achala. 9. Full manifestation of its Absolute Function is called the stage of finest wisdom, or Sadhumati. Ananda, as these Bodhisattvas complete their practice and training with great success, 
This is also called the stage of successful practice. And 10. They now realize the state in which sheltering clouds of compassion cover the ocean of nirvana. This is called the stage of dharma clouds, or dharma mega. The universal enlightenment. While the Tathagata goes against the holy current to appear in the world for his work of salvation, these bodhisattvas follow that current to reach their goals. The point where the former, the fruit ground, meets the latter, the cause ground, is called the stage of universal enlightenment, or Samyaksambodhi, the absolute or wonderful enlightenment. Ananda, the dry wisdom in the diamond mind can be fully realized only after passing through the whole process of bodhisattva development, that is, from the first stage of dry wisdom up to that of universal enlightenment. Thus, by passing through twelve stages, either singly or in groups of ten states each, absolute enlightenment can be completely realized for the attainment of supreme bodhi. Throughout these different stages achieved by means of diamond insight into the ten profound illusions, the Tathagata's clear perception, or vipassana, is effectively used during the stilling of mind, or shamatha, in gradual practice and training. Thus, Ananda, the three gradual steps to wipe out sansara, complete the fifty-five stages of bodhisattva development on the bodhi path. Such meditation is right, whereas any other is heretical. The Titles of This Sutra Thereupon, Bodhisattva Manjushri rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and asked, What name should be given to this sutra? And how should we and living beings receive and practice it? The Buddha replied, This sutra is called the unsurpassed seal of the supreme dharmas Sitatapatra, the pure and clean ocean eye of all Tathagatas in the ten directions. It is also called the Sutra on the Protection and Deliverance of Ananda and Bhikshuni, Self-Nature, of this assembly, so that they realize the Bodhi mind to enter the ocean of all wisdom. It is also called the practice and realization of the whole truth by means of the Tathagata's esoteric cause. It is also called the Universal Lotus King, the Dharni, of all Buddha mothers in the Ten Directions. It is also called the Bodhisattva's foremost practice of the Shurangma, of the Abhisheka, or Consecration Division. Under these five names, you should receive and practice this Sutra. Chapter 7 The Six Planes of Existence Caused by Unenlightenment The Six States of Living Beings in Sansara after hearing the Buddha's disclosure of the Sitatapatra's esoteric seal and of the whole truth as the titles of this sutra, Ananda and the assembly instantly awakened to the state of dhyana, the practice of which could lead to the holy stages and increase their understanding of the profound doctrine, so that they could wipe out all the troubles derived from the first six classes of delusion in the three realms of existence. Ananda then rose from his seat prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, brought his palms together, and said, O oh, august and world-honored one, your compassionate voice has revealed so skillfully to us the subtle delusions of all living beings for my great benefit, thereby bringing great comfort to my body and mind. World-honored one, if this bright and pure, absolute mind were essentially perfect, then even the great earth, plants, and trees, that is, inanimate things, as well as wriggling worms and all beings possessing life, that is, sentient beings would be the fundamental Bhuta Tathata, which is but the Tathagata's real substance in the state of Buddhahood. If the Buddha's substance were true and real, how could there also be the world of hells, hungry ghosts, animals, asuras, men, and devas? World-honored one, are these worlds fundamentally self-existent? Or do they arise because of living beings' vicious habit of dwelling in falsehood? 
world-honored one, let me illustrate what I mean. The Bhikshuni, Fragrance of the Precious Lotus, after receiving the rules of Bodhisattva discipline, fornicated and pretended that it was neither killing nor stealing, and was, therefore, not subject to karmic retribution. As a result, after her genital organ had been slowly scorched by the flame of passion, she fell into the unintermittent hell. King Crystal massacred men of the Gautama clan, and Bhikshu Sanakshatra wrongly preached the annihilation of all things and so implied that the law of causality was invalid. Both as a result of their evil acts fell into the Avicii hell. Are these hells really somewhere, or are they self-existing for every sinner to suffer in them? Will you be compassionate enough to enlighten us, so that those who observe the precepts know what they imply and do not break them? The Buddha said, It is good that you ask this question for the benefit of all living beings, so that they cease to hold wrong views. Listen attentively to what I now tell you. Ananda, all living beings are fundamentally pure, but because of their wrong views, they have formed vicious habits, hence their inner and outer affections. Ananda, inner affection concerns their inwardnesses. Because of the taint of desire, they give rise to wrong passions, the accumulation of which produces the water of craving. This is why the thought of good food makes the mouth water. The thought of a predecessor whom one pities or hates fills one's eyes with tears. The craving for wealth stirs one's heart and makes saliva flow and the body sleek. When the mind gives rise to sexual desire, the generative fluid flows from the male and female organs. Ananda, although these desires differ, their manifestations are all characterized by the secretion of water, which, by nature, flows downhill instead of up. This is inner affection. Ananda, outer affection concerns living beings externally. Their keen desires produce illusory thoughts, which, by continuous pursuit, become overwhelming. Thus, the mind bent on strict observance of the precepts makes the body light. The mind concentrated on incantations or mantra and mystic gestures or mudra gives a virile and resolute air. The mind set on rebirth in the heaven of gods brings dreams in which the practicer seems to fly upwards. The mind concentrated on the Buddha land causes holy realms to appear. And real devotion to a religious counselor or Kalyanamitra leads to the willing sacrifice of even one's own life. Ananda, although these thoughts differ, all these manifestations are, by nature, characterized by a lightness of body, which soars up instead of sinking down, so that they leap over their present states. This is outer affection. Ananda, in the round of births and deaths in sansara, birth is caused by the habits of passions, and death by the flow of retributive transformation. This is why at the moment of death and before the heat completely leaves the body, all good and evil deeds of a lifetime suddenly reappear to someone who is dead but on the point of being reborn. The Realm of Devas If his mind is wholly thoughtful, it will fly in the air and he will be reborn in heaven. If in this flight it is filled with blessedness and wisdom strongly sustained by his pure vow, it will open to let him behold the pure lands of all Buddhas in the ten directions. He will be reborn there as a result of his vow. The Realm of Seers or Rishi and Spirits If his mind is more thoughtful than passionate, it will not be light enough for him to fly to distant places. He will be reborn as a flying Rishi, a powerful king of ghosts, a flying Yaksha, or an earthbound Rakshasa. He will be able to roam freely in the heavens of the four Deva kings. If he is good-natured and has taken a vow to protect my Dharma and those who observe the precepts, repeat the mantras, meditate, and realize patient endurance, he will dwell beneath the throne of the Tathagata. 
the realm of human beings. If his thoughts and passions are in equal proportions, he will neither rise nor sink, but will be reborn in the realm of human beings, where his intelligence comes from the clearness of his thoughts, and his stupidity from the dullness of his passions. The Realm of Animals If his passions exceed his thoughts, he will be reborn in the realm of animals, where great passions create beasts with hair and fur, and mild passions produce winged and feathered creatures. The Realm of Hungry Ghosts if his passions and thoughts are in the proportion of seven to three, he will sink into the wheel of water close to the region of fire, will endure intense heat and be reborn as a hungry ghost whose body is constantly scorched by heat and drowned in water, so that he will suffer from hunger and thirst for hundreds and thousands of eons. The Realm of Hells If his passions and thoughts are in the proportion of nine to one, he will sink into the wheel of fire and be reborn where wind and fire meet. He will dwell in the intermittent hell if his passions are great, in the unintermittent one if they are very strong, and in the Avici hell if he is completely dominated by extremely violent ones. If, in addition, he slanders the Mahayana, breaks the Buddha's precepts, distorts the Dharma when preaching it to deceive his patrons for selfish gain or for fame, and commits the five rebellious acts and ten grave sins, he will be reborn in turn in all the Avicii hells. Although the above are self-inflicted retributions resulting from individual evil deeds, all sinners endure the same kinds of suffering which originate from the same concurrent causes. The Ten Causes and Six Effects in the Realm of Hells The Ten Karmic Causes of the Realm of Hells Ananda, these retributions come from the karmic acts of living beings who create ten karmic causes by their vicious habits and so suffer from six kinds of retribution. The Habit of Sexual Desire Ananda, what are these ten causes? Lust grows into a habit because of sexual intercourse, in which two people caress each other, thereby producing heat that in turn stimulates desire. This is like the heat caused by rubbing the hands together. The two habits from karma and lust stimulate each other and cause visions of hot iron beds on hot copper supports. Hence, all Buddhas regard sexual intercourse as a burning fire of desire and all bodhisattvas avoid carnality as if it was a fiery pit. The Habit of Craving Craving grows into a habit because of grasping, which is a kind of suction, which in time creates the illusion of cold, frost, chill, and shivering. This is like the cold sensation felt when one breathes in through pursed lips. The combination of karma and craving leads to retribution in the form of suffering expressed by crying out against biting cold and shown by the skin turning blue, red, or white. Hence, all Buddhas regard craving as the water of greed, and all bodhisattvas avoid it, as they would a sea of pestilential vapor. The Habit of Arrogance Arrogance grows into a habit because of abuse, which manifests by the oppression of others, which in time creates the illusion of restless waves, which build up a volume of water. This is like licking one's mouth to make it water. The two habits from karma and arrogance stimulate each other and create visions of rivers of blood, hot ashes, burning sand, poisonous seas, and molten copper poured on the sinner's tongue. And so all Buddhas regard self-importance as the water of stupidity, and all bodhisattvas avoid it as they would drowning. The Habit of Anger Anger grows into a habit because of irritation, which manifests as stubbornness, which in time inflames the heart, whose heat turns the vital breath into metal. Hence the illusions of hills of knives, iron posts, trees and wheels of swords, axes, halberds, spears and saws. 
This is like a man pushed by his obstinacy to avenge a wrong. The two habits, from karma and anger, stimulate each other and create visions of castration, hacking, beheading, chopping, wounding, mutilating, bludgeoning, and striking. This is like a man flying into a rage and ready to kill to redress a wrong. Hence, all Buddhas regard hatred as a sharp sword, and all Bodhisattvas flee from it, as from their own execution. The Habit of Deceitfulness Deceitfulness grows into a habit because of enticement, which manifests as deceit, which in time creates illusions of cords, sticks, ropes, and kangs that restrain the sinner. This is like a field flooded for growing grass and plants. The two habits from karma and deception sustain each other and create more and more evil deeds that deserve punishment with fetters, locks, whips, staves, birches, and cudgels. And so all Buddhists regard deceitfulness as harmful as calumny, and all bodhisattvas avoid it as they would a wolf. The Habit of Lying Lying grows into a habit because of beguilement, which manifests as fraud, which in time ends in treachery. This creates illusions of filth, such as dust, excrement, and urine. This is like dust blown by the wind, which screens everything. The two habits from karma and lies intensify each other and end in suffering from drowning, tossing, flying, dropping, drifting, and sinking. Hence, all Buddhas regard lying as harmful as plundering and killing, and all bodhisattvas avoid it as they would stepping on venomous snakes. The Habit of Resentment Resentment grows into a habit because of aversion, which manifests as malice. This creates illusions of being stoned, catapulted, shut in a prison van, trapped, bagged, and struck. This is like a mischief maker, always with evil designs. The two habits from karma and resentment combine and result in punishment by being tossed and hurled about, seized, apprehended, struck, and shot. And so all Buddhists regard resentment as an evil spirit, and all bodhisattvas avoid it as they would poisoned wine. The Habit of Wrong Views Wrong views grow into habit because of misinterpretation which covers the five misconceptions from the reality of the ego and objects down to rigorous ascetic prohibitions. This causes the misunderstanding of karmic effects due to rejection of the real and attachment to the unreal. Hence, the illusion of judgment with proofs of evidence which cannot be denied, as when two people coming from opposite directions cannot avoid meeting on the same road. The two habits from karma and wrong views combine to cause visions of questioning, cross-examination, judicial investigation, inquiry, interrogation, and the unveiling of right and wrong in court while good and bad counsel produce the documents and argue about them. Hence, all Buddhas regard wrong views as an abyss of perversion, and all Bodhisattvas avoid them as they would a ravine full of poison. The Habit of Unfairness Unfairness grows into a habit because of false accusation, which manifests in slander. This creates illusions of hills and rocks, which close in from all sides to crush, break, score, and grind the sinner. It is like abusing the innocent. Both habits from karma and injustice combine to bring about illusions of apprehension, pressure, beating, repression, coercion, and restraint of the sinner by the law. Hence, all Buddhas regard defamation as harmful as a tiger, and all bodhisattvas flee from it as from a clap of thunder. The Habit of Disputation Disputing grows into a habit because of much talk, which manifests in concealing one's shortcomings. This creates illusions of secrets being exposed by being reflected in a mirror, or by a lamp being lit, like objects that cannot be hidden in broad daylight. The two habits, from karma and disputation, end in the exposure of sins. For the mirror and lamp reveal former karmic deeds for final judgment. Hence, all Buddhas regard concealment as a secret enemy, 
and all bodhisattvas consider it as dangerous as carrying a hill on the head or walking into the ocean. The six retributive effects in the realm of hells. What are the six retributive effects? Ananda, all living beings whose six consciousnesses cause them to commit karmic acts, suffer from evil effects through the six sense organs. Retributive effects of wrong seeing. What are the evil effects suffered through the six sense organs? When karma ripens at the time of death, the evil effects of wrong seeing cause one to see a raging fire that fills the ten directions. His spirit will follow the smoke and, in a flash, will fall into the unintermittent hell where he will experience both light which reveals all sorts of evil things everywhere which give rise to boundless dread and silent darkness which hides everything and causes infinite fear. So the flame of wrong seeing scorches the organ of hearing and transforms it into purgatories of cauldrons of boiling water and seas of molten copper. The organ of smell into black smoke and purple flame. The organ of taste into hot pills and molten iron. The organ of touch into hot ashes and burning charcoal. And the organ of intellect into scattered sparks that disturb the whole of space. Retributive effects of wrong hearing. When karma ripens at the time of death, the evil effects of wrong hearing cause one to see rising waves that submerge heaven and earth. His spirit then follows them to fall into the unintermittent hell, where he will experience both unbearable noises that confuse and disturb him, and dead silence that makes him dispirited. So these waves flow into the organ of hearing to transform it into rebuke and interrogation, into the organ of sight to turn it into thunder, roars of animals, and jets of poisonous gas, into the organ of smell to change it into rain, fog, and showers of venomous insects that cover his whole body, into the organ of taste to transform it into pus, blood, and all sorts of filth, into the organ of touch to turn it into animals, ghosts, excrement, and urine, and into the organ of intellect to change it into lightning and hail that strike and break up his spirits retributive effects of wrong smelling. When karma ripens at the time of death, the evil effects of wrong smelling cause one to see clouds of poisonous gas everywhere. His spirit will leap from the earth to fall into the unintermittent hell, where he will experience both a state of free breathing that draws in all sorts of foul fumes that infect and upset his heart or mind, and of blocked breathing that chokes him until he swoons and drops to the ground. Thus, these foul airs enter the organ of smell to clear and obstruct his nostrils, the organ of sight to transform it into a flame or lighted torch, the organ of hearing to turn it into the sounds made by plunging into water, by drowning, and by never ceasing waves, the organ of taste into rotten and stinking fish, the organ of touch into a ripped and decomposed corpse and a great hill of flesh with hundreds and thousands of eyes to see itself being devoured by countless beasts, and the organ of thinking into dust, miasmas and flying pebbles that strike and break his body. Retributive Effects of Wrong Tasting When karma ripens at the time of death, the evil effects of wrong tasting cause the person concerned to see an iron net and a great blaze of fire that cover the whole world. His spirit will then rise to drop upside down into the net with his head caught in its meshes and he will then be drawn into the unintermittent hell where he will both feel that his in-breath is transformed into bitter cold that bites his body and his out-breath turned into fierce fire that scorches his bones and marrow. Thus, this wrong tasting enters the organ of taste to transform it into great hardships, the organ of sight into molten metal and rock, the organ of hearing into sharp weapons, the organ of smell into a huge iron cage that covers the whole country, 
the organ of touch into longbows and arrows, and into crossbows and bolts, and the organ of thinking into iron hail that rains down. Retributive effects of wrong touching. When karma ripens at the time of death, the evil effects of wrong touch cause one to see great mountains closing in from all the four quarters with no way to escape. His spirit will see an iron-walled town, fiery snakes and dogs, tigers, wolves, and lions, jailers with ox heads, and rakshasas with horse heads, holding spears and lances, who chase him into the town and force him into the unintermittent hell, where he will experience both the embrace of mountains contact that close in to crush his body into a mess of bones, flesh, and blood, and the pain of being cut up or separation when sharp swords slay his body and rip open his heart and liver. Thus, this wrong touch enters its own organ to transform it into the road to hell and the abode of Yama with hall and judgment seat, the organ of sight into heat and burning, the organ of hearing into knocking, striking, stabbing, and shooting, the organ of smell into apprehending, bagging, judging, and roping, the organ of taste into plowing, nipping, beheading, and cutting, and the organ of intellect into flying, falling, frying, and roasting. Retributive Effects of Wrong Thinking When karma ripens at the time of death, the evil effects of wrong thinking cause one to see evil winds blow through and destroy the country. His spirit will be blown up into space and then dropped down to be carried into the unintermittent hell where he will suffer from both the utter confusion that obscures all his senses and frightens him into ceaseless running about, and from the perfect clarity in which all his senses function in good order, to feel unbearable pain when he is being fried and scorched. Thus, this wrong thinking enters his faculty of thought to transform it into a receptacle, the organ of seeing into scrutinizing and evidencing, the organ of hearing into a rock, its warmth into ice and frost, and its clearness into dust and fog. The organ of smell into a great fiery chariot, vessel, and cage. The organ of taste into cries, screams, lamentation, and weeping. The organ of touch into a large or small body, subject in a single day to tens of thousands of births and deaths. Ananda. These are the ten causes and six effects of the realm of hells, which are all created by living beings through their own delusion and falseness. Degrees of perversity in relation to suffering in the hells. If at all times a living being creates these three karmic causes of retributive effects to be suffered by all six sense organs, he will fall into the Avicii hell, where he will endure untold miseries for countless eons. If at times he creates individual karmic causes of retributive effects to be suffered by his sense organs separately, he will fall into the eight unintermittent hells. If he kills, steals, and is carnal in body, mouth, and mind, he will fall into the eighteen lesser hells. If he does not commit these three evil deeds which involve body, mouth, and mind, but occasionally kills or steals, he will fall into the thirty-six lesser hells. If he commits only one of them with a single sense organ, he will fall into the one hundred and eight minor hells. Thus, all living beings, though creating their own causes of retributive effects, have to endure the same corresponding sufferings in the same hells which are the products of their wrong thinking and which fundamentally do not exist. The Ten Categories in the Realm of Hungry Ghosts Further, Ananda, if living beings violate the precepts, break the rules of bodhisattva discipline, destroy belief in the self-possessed Buddha nature, and create the above-mentioned ten karmic causes, after being scorched in the hells for successive eons, they will have paid for all the wrong they have done, and will be reborn in the realm of hungry ghosts. 1. If craving be the cause of their misdeeds, they will, 
after paying for their sins, take the form of whatever they meet on leaving the hells to become strange ghosts. 2. If lust be the cause of their misdeeds, they will, after paying for their sins, take form when blown by the wind on leaving the hells to become draught ghosts. 3. If deceitfulness be the cause of their misdeeds, they will, after paying for their sins, take form when meeting animals to become animal ghosts. 4. If hate be the cause of their misdeeds, they will, after paying for their sins, take form when meeting worms and insects to become noxious ghosts. 5. If revengefulness be the cause of their misdeeds, they will, after paying for their sins, take form in the midst of misfortune and calamity to become cruel ghosts. 6. If arrogance be the cause of their misdeeds, they will, after paying for their sins, take form when meeting oppressed people to become starved ghosts. 7. If fraud be the cause of their misdeeds, they will, after paying for their sins, take form when finding themselves in dark places to become nightmarish ghosts. 8. If wrong views be the cause of their misdeeds, they will, after paying for their sins, take form when meeting sprites to become naiads. 9. If unfairness be the cause of their misdeeds, they will, after paying for their sins, take form when seeing the light to become servant ghosts. And 10. If disputation be the cause of their misdeeds, they will, after paying for their sins, take form when meeting mediums to become messenger ghosts to relay the news from the dead. Ananda these beings are completely dominated by their passions, which cause their fall into the realm of hells, where they are scorched dry by the flame of passion, and from which they will emerge as hungry ghosts. These states are the products of karma created by wrong thinking. If they awaken to Bodhi, they will find that fundamentally these karmic states cannot be found in the profound, perfect, and bright mind. The Ten Categories of Animals, Birds, etc. Further, Ananda, when all karmic effects have been completely endured in the realm of hungry ghosts, that is, after the consequences of passions and thoughts have ended, they will be reborn as animals, birds, etc., who meet their former creditors to repay outstanding debts. 1. Strange Ghosts after expiating their misdeeds in their realms, are mostly reborn as owls. 2. Drought ghosts, after expiating their misdeeds in their realm, are mostly reborn as unlucky creatures who foretell misfortunes and calamities. 3. Animal ghosts, after expiating their misdeeds in their realm, are mostly reborn as foxes. 4. Noxious ghosts, after expiating their misdeeds in their realm, are mostly reborn as venomous creatures. 5. Cruel Ghosts After expiating their misdeeds in their realm, are mostly reborn as tapeworms. 6. Starved Ghosts After expiating their misdeeds in their realm, are mostly reborn as creatures good for food. 7. Nightmarish Ghosts after expiating their misdeeds in their realm, are mostly reborn as creatures who provide materials for clothing. 8. Naiads After expiating their misdeeds in their realm, are mostly reborn as creatures through whom the future can be foretold. 9. Servant Ghosts After expiating their misdeeds in their realm, are mostly reborn as auspicious creatures. And 10. Messenger Ghosts After expiating their misdeeds in their realm, are mostly reborn as domestic animals. Ananda, these hungry ghosts, after withering because of the scorching effect of the flame of their passions to repay their former debts, are thus reborn as animals, birds, etc. These states are caused by their karmic misdeeds. But if they awaken to the Bodhi mind, 
they will find that the causes of falsehood fundamentally do not exist. You have mentioned Bhikshuni fragrance of precious lotus, king crystal, and Bhikshu Sanakshatra. But you should know that their evil karmas came from neither heaven nor earth, nor were they imposed on them by others. Since their evil deeds were self-made, they had to suffer from the consequences, which were the congelation of passing false thoughts in the Bodhi mind. Further, Ananda, if these creatures, while paying their former debts, are made to repay more than is just, they will be reborn as men to reclaim the difference. If the creditors are men of good virtue and can repay the outstanding balance, they will keep their human state while doing so. But if they are men of little virtue, they will be reborn as animals to make good the amount received in excess. Ananda, you should know, that if the indebtedness consists of money and labor, it will be cancelled as soon as it has been reimbursed. But if, in addition to recovering it, the creatures concerned are killed to provide food for the creditors, this will start between debtors and creditors an endless round of mutual killing and eating which can be brought to an end only by the practice of Shamatha, or when a Buddha appears in the world to teach them the Dharma. The Ten Categories in the Realm of Human Beings 1. You should know that owls, after repaying their former debts, are reborn as wayward men in the realm of human beings. 2. Inauspicious creatures, after repaying their former debts, are reborn as men with animal habits. 3. Foxes, after repaying their former debts, are reborn as vulgar men. 4. Venomous creatures, after repaying their former debts, are reborn as savages. 5. Tapeworms, after repaying their former debts, are reborn as vile men. 6. Creatures good for food, after repaying their former debts, are reborn as cowards. 7. Animals providing materials for wearing apparel after repaying their former debts are reborn as servile men. 8. Creatures through whom the future can be foretold after repaying their former debts are reborn as literary men. 9. Auspicious creatures after repaying their former debts are reborn as intelligent men. 10. Domestic animals, after repaying their former debts, are reborn as men versed in the ways of the world. Ananda, these living beings, after repaying their debts, are reborn in the realm of human beings, because since the time without beginning, they have, on account of their karma and perversion, killed one another and have not met the Buddha or heard the right Dharma. Hence their transmigration according to the law of sansara. They are most pitiable. The Ten Categories in the Realm of Seers, or Rishis Ananda, there are men who, instead of cultivating the Samadhi of right Bodhi, practice immortality wrongly according to their false thoughts, thus preserving their thinking and bodies. They are fond of living in mountains, groves, and uninhabitable places. There are ten classes of them. 1. Ananda those men who diet specially to preserve their bodies and thereby live long through dieting are called earthbound seers. 2. Those who take herbs and fruits to preserve their bodies and thereby live long through taking medicine are called flying seers. 3. Those who take mineral products to preserve their bodies and thereby live long by means of alchemy are called unhindered roaming seers. 4. Those who regulate their organic functions to preserve their bodies and thereby live long by means of proper breathing are called immaterial seers. 5. Those who make good use of controlling their saliva to preserve their bodies and thereby live long by means of their glowing spirituality are called heavenly seers. 6. Those who feed on the vital principle of nature to preserve the essence of form and thereby live long by absorbing natural purity are called all-entering seers. 7. 
Those who use incantations to preserve their bodies and thereby live long by means of occultism are called seers of the lesser Tao. 8. Those who concentrate on their thoughts to preserve their bodies and thereby live long by means of mental concentration are called illuminating seers. 9. Those who practice the integration of the positive and negative principles to preserve their bodies and thereby live long by means of the spiritual harnessing power of yoga are called spiritual seers. And 10. Those who practice sublimation of their bodies and thereby live long by means of spiritual awareness are seers of the highest order. Ananda, these men regulate their minds, but do not practice the right Bodhi, and live for perhaps a thousand and ten thousand years. They live on high mountains or desert islands and cut off all worldly connections. Their states still belong to the sansaric stream of wrong thoughts, and since they do not practice samadhi, when they have enjoyed their conditioned blessing, they will have to return to the lower planes of existence. The Realm of the Gods or Devloka, the six heavens of the realm of desire, or Kamadhatu. 1. Ananda, there are men who do not seek the permanent because they cannot relinquish their love for their wives. They, however, do not commit adultery, and so their minds are clear and bright. After their death, they will be reborn in the regions near the sun and the moon, called the four heavens of the four Deva kings, or Chatur Maharaja Kaika. 2. There are men who, though living with their wives, are lukewarm about love and sexual desire. Their chastity is, therefore, not perfect, and so, after their death, they will be reborn in the regions above the sun and the moon, and on the top of the world, called the Triastrincha heavens. 3. Those whose sexual indulgence is only incidental and is then always forgotten and who prefer tranquility to disturbance will, after their death, be reborn in space where they will dwell in brightness which eclipses the light of the sun and moon because of their luminous bodies. This is the Suyama heaven. 4. Those who live in tranquility at all times but are still not yet immune to disturbance will, after their death, be reborn in the subtle region which is beyond the reach of men and lower devas and which remains unaffected by the three calamities of fire, water, and wind during the kalpa of world destruction. This is the Tushita heaven. 5. Those who have relinquished all sexual desires but are prepared to satisfy those of their wives and who feel as if they chew tasteless wax during the intercourse will, after their death, be reborn in the region attainable by leaps and bounds direct from the realm of human beings. This is the Nirmarna Rati Heaven. 6. Those who have cut off their worldly minds and are thus free from earthly prejudices when dealing with worldlings will, after their death, be reborn in the region beyond those where joy is attainable and unattainable at will. This is the Paranirmita Vashavartin Heaven. Ananda, though these six realms of heavens are free from mental disturbances, they still retain the conception of mind. Hence, they are called realms of desires. <laughs>